Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Bailey, and I'm an event host here at House Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you all to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual and in-person events by visiting our website at powells.com and clicking on the events tab at the top of the page. Please remember to follow us on our various social media channels such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, tonight, we're honored to welcome author Lynn Cox in conversation with Chris Carter to discuss Lynn's book, Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog. When Lynn saw a video of a Newfoundland dog leaping from an airborne helicopter into Italian waters to save someone from drowning, Lynn was transfixed by the rescue and captivated by the magnificence, physicality, and daring of the dog. Tales of Al is an inspiring story of Lynn's adventures on Italy's picturesque Lake Idrascalo, as witness to the rigorous training of one of these spectacular dogs at SICS, the famed school that has taught hundreds of dog owners how to train their dogs for this rescue operation. Lynn writes about coming to know Al from puppyhood as an adorable but untrainable chocolate Newfoundland to the dreams, expectations, disappointments, and vision of her trainer, and finally about realizing dog's full potential, striving with all her canine might to become an expertly trained, highly specialized water rescue dog. Lynn Cox is the author of multiple books, including Swimming to Antarctica and Grayson. She has set open water swimming records all over the world while swimming without a wetsuit. She was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. Her articles have appeared in many publications, among them The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Los Angeles Times Magazine. Lynn is joining us from Southern California. Lynn will be joined in conversation by Chris Carter. Chris has created one of the most successful television franchises of all time, which is award-winning The X-Files. Chris also created the shows Millennium, Harsh Realm, and The Lone Gunman. He is also joining us from Southern California. This evening's event will also include a Q&A. Uh, please use the Q&A button. It's located at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. If someone has already asked a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support Lynn and Powell's by purchasing a copy of Tales of Al. Keep an eye out in the chat where I will be sharing links to purchase this title. Now, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Lynn Cox and Chris Carter. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks. Nice to see you, of course. Uh, uh, we're both in Southern California, but uh, a little bit uh, distance apart. And I'm thinking that uh, we should probably tell each uh, or tell the, everyone how we know each other and uh, what our connections are. I think uh, beyond uh, dogs, the uh, swimming. Swimming was the connection and it has been so much fun to meet with you and swim with you in Santa Barbara area and to the north and down in the south in the bay and in Los Alamitos, Los Alamitos Bay area and just uh, talk and enjoy being out there and train. Yeah, uh, I always love swimming with you, Webb, because uh, uh, I'm swimming with someone who's swum in almost every body of water from around the world. Uh, so it's always the treat. Well, it's been fun swimming with you because you look so effortless. It's, it's amazing to be beside somebody who just flows with the water and then to see somebody that's working so hard and you just think, wow, I just wish that he could do what Chris is doing. <laughs> just moving right along. I'll take the uh, compliment. Um, you begin your book with uh, a poem by Mary Oliver uh, and I'm going to read it. Because of a dog's joyfulness, our own is increased. It is no small gift. Uh, I think that's lovely and a beautiful uh, way to, to begin your book. Um, I, I want to say that this, uh, as the introduction uh, told us, this is a book about a dog named Al, an Italian water rescue dog, who gives so many people in the book joy, like the Mary Oliver poem, but it's about so much more. Um, and uh, I, some of the... Uh, the chapter titles are uh, Hot Chocolate and Beth, Focaccia and the Iditarod, to Biscotti the Lion Dog. This is a book about dogs, but it's also a book about food. Uh, it seems like every chapter begins with a meal, uh, and uh, uh, they all sound uh, as one as delicious as the next. Well, I think that a lot of swimmers and dog owners and people who are adventuresome 
like to go out and do things and explore and come back and eat. And one of the really wonderful things about this journey to Italy to learn about Al was that I was invited to sit down at the dinner table and to share a meal, a really long, real Italian Northern cooking meal and to explore the different cuisine. And that was as much fun as it was to be in Italy and learn about the dogs and how they trained. Well, uh, it, it makes you, your mouth water, the, the book, uh, uh, Like a Dog. Um, it, it's also, a, a, you know, it's a, a book uh, also about music from Puccini to the sound of waves. Uh, you even mention a ritardando in the book, uh, which I thought was uh, interesting. And I couldn't help thinking about your husband, Stephen, and conversations you must have had with him uh, about music. Well, Stephen is an opera singer and a classical pianist, and he also played the horn. And so he has this incredible background in music. And we were talking about the sound of the water and the sound of the waves and what it's like to be immersed in, in both. And I said, you know, there are different symphonies, right, about the sea. So Stephen started recounting all the different titles and all the different musical pieces for musical story pieces like that. And so I said, you know, I would like to be able to describe a single wave musically. And so that became a real challenge of what does it sound like when it begins and when it grows and when it crashes and when it falls onto the beach and then starts to recede. So I was able to talk to Stephen about that and figure out how to describe this whole procession in words and go with the musical, the Italian musical words. And it was really fun to be able to create that because I've never heard of anyone doing that before and um, to be able to draw on his knowledge and then to be able to speak in a different way um, about seeing a wave. Well, as I said, it makes the books about so much more than dogs and, uh, uh, it, and makes it a, a beautiful book in so many ways. Um, the book begins uh, uh, in a snow pond in Maine, and uh, it strikes me that uh, from Maine to Long Beach, California, where you grew up as a teenager, your connection to water and to dogs really began in your youth. Uh, can you talk about that? Yes, my parents really wanted the whole family to be water safe, and so we would go to snow pond and in, in Maine to visit my grandparents. And it turned out that my grandfather was an amazing swimmer. He swam long distances in Snow Pond, but he also swam in the Hudson River. And he had this real reverence for the water. And so when my mom was really little, he made sure she learned to swim. And she then and my dad decided that when we were, my brother and my two sisters and I were really small, that we would learn to swim as well. So it right away became a family sport and time for us to be together. And then at one point we wound up getting a Dalmatian named Beth. And Beth turned out to be taught the same way that we were with just gentleness, with support, with an understanding that, you know, this is supposed to be fun and not frightening. And so, you know, our parents never like threw us in the water. In fact, we got admonished for pushing somebody off the dock into the water because we could get hurt. It's really interesting because my dad was a doctor and he was very much about preventing accidents. So because of that, we all grew up with a sense of we need to be prepared for something. We need to do it the right way. And so I think that, you know, teaching Beth to swim was something my parents did, but I get a chance to do that as well. And years and years and years later, I'd find out that people would not only just throw their children or push their friends into the water and expect them to swim, that this was also done with dogs. And I didn't think that that was the right way. And so I think part of the reason why I wanted to go to Italy at one point was to see how they train these elite water dogs to make sure that they were doing it in a kind and gentle way too. Right. I, you know, you, uh, you talk about your dog, Beth, uh, and uh, I know how close you were to her because you actually recount that she had 332 spots. 
Well, that's what I counted sometimes. And, you know, sometimes some spots blurred into the others. And so you quite, weren't quite sure. It was at 332 or 343. Yeah. But she had so many spots and it was just fun. And she would let me count them. But also she had two big black velvety ears. And apparently Dalmatians are, points are taken off if they have black ears. They are not supposed to have that much black but I thought they looked so great on her. And she was my best pal when I was a little kid, you know. You know uh, it reminds me that uh, uh, I once read something uh, written by Loudon Wainwright, the editor of Life Magazine. And he says that we, measure, we can measure our life in dogs, the ones we've had and the ones we've loved. And I think that that, uh, I know for me, that's true uh, from uh, a very young age to even now with my dogs. Uh, you, uh, you you live the uh, wonderful years with uh, a dog, and uh, I think you t you can measure your life in dogs. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think that they are some some beings that are just with us all the time. I mean, when I was writing my first book, my very you know serious first book, I was actually in Laguna Beach house sitting and dog sitting for my friend who had three Newfoundland dogs. And so it was really fantastic to be there working away and to have these three dogs that were big, as big as bears lying all around the floor. And I knew that I was totally safe, that nobody was going to come into that house without them letting me know. And they were also just so calm and reassuring that they were there with me. And I think that you know, you, you love the dog that's in your family, but I think that also extends out to the neighbors as well. Right now, because I travel so much, I can't have a dog. So they're, the dogs in the neighborhood are, are, I look forward to seeing them as much as the neighbors. Yeah. You, you, you talk about your dog, Cody, that was kind of the neighborhood dog that uh, a kid said that uh, she doesn't belong to you, she belongs to everyone. Yeah, he, Cody was an exceptional dog. He had been brought up by the neighbor who had him and made a big deal over him for the first three years of his life. And then the husband and wife next door had twins and their lives radically changed because of the attention they had to give to the twins. And so Cody was sort of put into the background. So when Cody was six years old, I just saw him moping on the side of the house and I had seen him a lot like that. And so I went over to the neighbor and said, would you mind if I walk Cody? So she said, sure, go ahead. So i started to do this every day. We walk three or four or five miles together. And he was the best dog. He would just walk beside me and enjoyed the whole walk. And when I got him back, I'd give him a big brushing and he'd go back home and sort of lie on the outside and be sad again. And so after about three months, his owner asked me, would you like him? And so I said, yes, of course. And he was um, a dog that I could take anywhere with me and who was really connected to people. He would go to Seal Beach in California and walk along and suddenly stop by a young boy, for instance, who was in a wheelchair and let the boy pet him. And afterwards, I found out that his assistant's dog had died a couple days before. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Cody somehow knew, you know, these things about people and that they just needed a little bit more attention. I, I think that really comes through to uh, the intuitiveness of the dogs uh, in Italy and uh, how they, they read, uh, you know, in the case of Al and Donatella, how uh, Al can read Donatella's every mood and every gesture and every uh, expression. She, Al was so in tune to Donatella and she watched her constantly and really, really wanted to please her. But Al often didn't get what Donatella was trying to get her to do. And so often Al was a big disappointment. The truth is that Al was a really special dog and Donatella was a very special person because she also realized that just because an Al wasn't understanding her, that maybe there was something more that Donatella needed to do to help convey what she was expecting of Al. And I think that that was really great because both of them were trying to understand each other and connect. 
And initially when I met the two of them, Al was too exuberant and, and wild and wanted to do everything that it seemed Donatella didn't want her to do. So, um, and it was also embarrassing for Donatella because this large dog was not like Alicia, the Newfoundland dog that she had had before, who was just the perfect Newfoundland. So it was embarrassing that Al was, didn't meet the standard of what she was expecting. Right, right. Uh, Al had big paws to fill there. Uh, she the really word. did. Yes. You know. Yeah. You know, it, it, at times uh, it felt like uh, Donatella's uh, self-esteem uh, was connected to this dog, uh, how the dog did, uh, how obedient it was, how it worked uh, with the other dogs and, uh, and um, just uh, it, it, she, her connection to this dog was almost, um, you know, preternatural. It was very much that they were connected, that they had worked together a lot. Al was two years old when I met her. And right from the start, Donatella introduced her to Alicia and tried to get Alicia to help start training Al. But at some point, Alicia, who was this award-winning televised dog all around Italy and around the world, who had received all sorts of trophies and medals, just got tired of Al. And, and it was hard for Donatella because she really expected Al to be able to do as well as Alicia. And at the same time, she realized that, you know, she was a very different dog than Alicia. And as I go through and I go to Italy and I meet them both and spend time with them, there's a change that occurs and an understanding that develops that, you know, part of the story is, is learning that and experiencing that. And Hopefully people see that this doesn't just apply to dogs, it applies to people. And I think that was also one of the reasons why I was so drawn to going there is because, you know, as an athlete and one who had tried to achieve a really high level, I've had extraordinary coaches that have helped me do that. So I really wanted to see how Donatella worked with Al, but also the other dogs there that were in training. There were Labradors and Golden Retrievers and German Shepherds and Leonbergers that were there learning to be water rescue dogs. And there, each dog was different, just like each person was different. And the trainers and Donatella had to help the owners of the dogs learn how to train the dogs as much as the dogs needed to learn. It was really interesting. You know, uh, it, one of the most striking images is the uh, image of a dog leaping out of a helicopter. Uh, you know, uh, I've, I've been around helicopters a lot, actually. And uh, the idea of these dogs uh, leaping not only out of helicopters into the water, but into the helicopters that are hovering above the ground uh, sounds like uh, the unsung heroes here might be the helicopter pilots as well. <laughs> Um, but but the idea of dogs and helicopters, uh, it's it's not a combination you think about. No, it isn't. And actually, I thought that was what really intrigued me. How could they get these giant Newfoundlands into the helicopters? And did they want to go? And were they afraid of the sound of the helicopter? And what would happen if the dog got up in the helicopter and saw somebody in the water struggling? Did they want to jump out into the water and rescue the person? I mean, when the helicopter lowered to the surface of the water, it was still about 10 or 12 feet off the water. And I've done a few dives off that high and it hurts if you land wrong. So I had all these questions and it was really fun to go there and see. I didn't get a chance to see them leaping on helicopters, but I did see them one of them doing work with the Italian Coast Guard and leaping off the Coast Guard boat. And Al, in that case, was so excited to participate. It wasn't a question of being afraid or not afraid. It was, I'm happy to be here. Let me do what I'm trained to do. Right. Um, you, you, you connect your early dog relationships to Donatella and uh, uh, who we uh, have mentioned is the owner of Al. Uh, your dog, Beth, let's go back to Beth, was vigilant with your mom in the water. So you had those ex uh, relation, uh, experiences very early on. Um, can you talk about uh, your uh, early experience with uh, 
dogs and uh, rescue? When we were young, I was probably eight or nine years old, we got Beth and my folks taught her how to swim and I got involved in helping her as well. But one of the things that happened is that we would go swimming at night as a family just to cool off on those hot summer days in Maine and Beth would join us, but she would always try to grab onto my mom's wrist and pull her to shore. She was always worried that something might happen to her. She didn't care about the rest of us, <laughs> but mom was the most important. And my mom always had to reassure her that she was okay. Actually, there have been other instances. My book agent in upstate New York has a German short hair slash Dalmatian mix. And when she goes swimming in the pond in upstate New York, Frankie, her dog tries to pull her into shore. So I don't know if it's something within the Dal Dal Dalmatian breed or if it's just the dog is being overprotective, but that was where I saw a dog starting to do rescues. And through the years, there have been instances where I've seen dogs swimming offshore and being great at swimming, but I've never seen a dog pull somebody in. And I think that watching that video that you mentioned a little earlier about the Newfoundland leaping out of the helicopter and rescuing somebody, that really intrigued me. Like, how does somebody teach a dog to do that? I mean, it's really a big deal sometimes if you can teach a dog to sit and lie down or shake hands, but to leap from a helicopter, swim over to a person, present a hand a harness and a ha handle on the harness so that the dog can pull you to shore. How do you do that? And yeah. um, it was really interesting because there's so many parallels between that and a way a coach teaches a swimmer how to do a new stroke. You know, you'd see the coach starting somebody with breathing for freestyle and getting them to a certain point where they could turn their head to breathe and feel comfortable with it. And then the next part was to move their arms. But if there was a skill they couldn't do, the coach for a human being would back away. The same thing I saw happening with the dogs, where you would see the instructor or the owner taking the dog to a place where it could succeed. But if it couldn't succeed, they didn't stop the lesson there, they backed away and they did something else where the dog was successful. And then they came back to it another day. And I thought, it's really amazing. You can teach or train elite athletes like you train elite dogs. There's yeah. that idea of reinforce positive outcomes and success and back away when it's not working, come back and try something different. Uh, you, you have a, uh, uh, an interesting uh, anecdote in the book about uh, Jimmy. Uh, a boy who was afraid to swim, and you actually teach him uh, to actually mimic a the way a dog swims, which I thought was really interesting. So it works both ways. Yes, it does. And actually, Jimmy, for years, I taught children and adults how to swim. And so often I would be called by a parent whose child was terrified of the water for some reason. And also, I get calls from adults who, as children, had fallen into a pool or had been thrown into a pond or a lake, and they were terrified of the water, and then they wanted to learn. But with Jimmy, when I met him, he was five years old, and he had had a horrible experience with a swimming teacher who had just thrown him in the water and expected him to swim, and he was terrified, and the instructor did it again and scared him even more. So when I got to him, the last thing he wanted to do was to get in the water. But he had two chocolate Labradors that he absolutely adored, and Fifi and Juliet. And he talked about them when we first met, about how he loved them so much. And so he was the one that basically taught me how to teach him. He was the one that was like, okay, I need to use his dogs as a way to teach him how to swim. So we were able to get the dogs into the pool and have the dogs dog paddle and have him imitate the dogs doing dog paddle. And then eventually they started playing together and he forgot about being afraid and he started to like the water. And now years later, I mean, he wound up becoming a swimmer on the high school team. He wound up playing water polo. He wound up becoming a rower and he adopted dogs. So it's, it was such a great story to be able to write about. 
I love that story. And, and the story about the young girl too, whose uh, basset hounds nearly drowned, uh, who knew you could give uh, uh, CPR to uh, basset hounds. I hadn't known that either. And that was what was also, I thought, important to talk about is that, you know, people are really aware that you can't leave a child by the pool and not watch him or her. And they're aware that, you know, you want to make sure that there's a lifeguard around and no foot to do if something happens to anybody in the water. But I don't think that most people are aware that, you know, the doggy door being left open can be a bad thing where your pet can fall in the backyard pool and not get out and die. And actually I had four different friends that had this happened. And so one of the things that I learned from being in Italy was that they require the dogs to wear these inflatable harnesses with the handles on them when they're doing the training. And they also require the, the people to wear life vests. So they are so safety oriented. But um, I think that writing the book was also a way to say, you know, you've got to be careful with your dogs as well. And in Southern California now, you'll see people on and stand up paddle boards with their dogs that are wearing life vests. And you think, gee, they understand that chihuahuas or little terriers don't have a lot of floatability and their legs are so short, it's hard for them to swim. So it makes a lot of sense to think of those things. I, I once, uh, uh, I have a paddle, not a stand up paddle board, but a, uh, a lying down a prone paddle board. And uh, I once took my little dog, Teddy, and her little life preserver out on, and I was going to have her ride on the bow with me out in the ocean. And uh, she wasn't having any of it, and she climbed on my back. And so we, we paddled for miles with this little dog uh, sitting on my back, uh, little, little Teddy, who's now 13 years old. Uh, yeah, it's the other thing. You never know how somebody or some dog is going to react. And for the most part, you know, just whatever it is, you do it slowly and gradually, it'll have a good outcome. But, yep. you know, there I've seen dogs now that are actually surfing on surfboards on I their know, own, which I, is... I see that too. It's amazing. Um, you, you first saw the rescue dogs, then we, you talked about this in a video at the, uh, it, it's the SI, SICS, right? The uh, Scuola Italiana Cani Salvataggio, Salvataggio uh, and the uh, Garda Costiera. Um, and uh, it, it took you some resourcefulness to find the school and the dogs, but you've always been resourceful. And I'm reminded of your efforts to gain permission to swim in the Bering Strait. Uh, you uh, somehow uh, figured out how to work with the Soviet Union, uh, the FBI, and uh, various other agencies to uh, get permission to swim in the Bering Strait. So you've always been a resourceful person. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, for the Bering Strait swim, that just took 11 years to get permission to, from the Soviets. And it actually was writing to senators and congressmen and people in the State Department and the Soviet foreign ministry and contacting anyone that I could think of that would have any connections to the Soviet Union. And finally, through Ted Turner, I made some connections and through the State Department and then the US ambassador to the Soviet Union, the Soviet ambassador to the United States, I was able to get, get the approval finally from Gorbachev. But initially I wrote to Brezhnev and Andropov and Chinyanko and never heard anything from them. But when I wanted to do that swim, it was at a time when Gorbachev was presenting the idea about glasnost, about openness. And so the idea was to swim across the Bering Strait to open the border between the US and Soviet Union. So for those 11 years, every single day, I was working on that project, trying to get permission. And I think that that's what really helped me later on when I was trying to figure out, you know, you're watching something on a computer screen and you're thinking, I really want to go see this in person. I really want to figure out how it happens. How do I make those connections? And so it suddenly occurred to me that I knew a friend who had been an Air Force pilot who had been stationed in off off. Italy. And he knew somebody that was a naval attache. And then I thought, okay, the dogs in Italy that are training work with the Italian Coast Guard. 
So maybe the U.S. Naval Attaché will know how to get a hold of the Italian Coast Guard, and through them, I'll be able to reach out to the Scuola Italiana Carne Salvataggio, the Italian School of Water Rescue Dogs. And so through those connections, I was able to reach out to the U.S. Embassy, who was so excited about putting me in touch with this school in Northern Italy, and they helped me get in touch with Donatella Pasquale and explain that she spoke fairly good English and that I was invited to meet with her and the dogs and be there as long as I wanted to, to learn about the school and what they were doing. So that whole background for 11 years of doing research really helped me figure out how to reach out to the Italians. I, I love that story when you uh, swam the Bering Strait and you walked ashore and there were uh, reporters and someone asked you how long the swim had took, taken, and you said uh, two hours, six minutes, and 11 years. Uh, yeah. I love that. That was a great line. I mean, uh, the poise you had to say that after having swum uh, five miles in uh, frigid water. Well, the thing is that I think most people just look at the finish of something and think, oh, you completed it. I mean, when you've been writing your scripts and when you were projecting, when you're doing all sorts of production and direction and working with the X-Files, people would just see the finalized product or the finalized series on television. And it took you years probably to develop that whole idea and then to be able to produce that. I mean, once a week for how many years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, but, uh, you know, uh, 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 that may be so, but uh, swimming uh, f five miles in the uh, in the Arctic uh, it doesn't quite compare. It's different, but each of us has different big goals in our lives and things that we want to do and special gifts that we've been given and learn how to develop one way or the other. And we do something with them or we don't. And I think often I look at the swims that I've done or the books that I've written as the background, the research, the training is like the major part of the mountain and the summit's just the last part. And it's sort of like, well, all that work you get to now show what it was that you wanted to do. Now right. you have that moment that you can do it. And it's such a privilege to be able to, to go forward and, and shine. And sometimes it doesn't always work and sometimes there's disappointment, but you know, I've learned through the course of writing books that the first draft is never it. I mean, you must know that too from all the things, oh, you must, you know, from all, the, all that you've done that the first script isn't the first, it's not done, that there's so many rewrites involved. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I know something about your uh, training regimen. And so uh, I know how hard you would work to actually uh, accomplish many of the crossings and uh, the uh, your major swims, uh, so um, I, I can appreciate what you're talking about. Um, let me see. When you went to Italy to see the rescue dogs, you've written nine books. Did you ever have any idea that this would become a book? No. When I went to Italy to watch the dogs train, I was just trying to learn what they did and find out more about them and, and see if the dogs liked doing what they were doing and learn more about the community of people that were volunteering their time and working with the group to help patrol the waters off Italy and also off of Switzerland and Germany at times. So I wasn't there with the intention of writing a book, but during the time when we were all secluded uh, because of COVID, I thought, you know, my life is going by and I feel this urge to tell the story. And so I started reflecting on, I had written notes, I had kept some pictures, I had thought about, you know, how would I tell the story? And when I started to write it, I was waking up at three in the morning, so excited to tell the story about Al, but also about dogs and love and courage and swimming and being an elite athlete and how you connect all those together. So I wound up each day getting up, working out, well, writing from three to seven in the morning and then working out in the bay 
in Long Beach and thinking about what I'd just written and coming back and either continuing to write or going back and editing my work. And I produced this book within a year. But then it took about a year or so of editing for it to finally reach the place that it could become a book. And um, I'm really excited about it because it's a happy story. You know, it's yep. there's so much going on in the world that's not really happy or it's disjointed or difficult. And I think that it's really nice to be able to talk about good things that are in the world and people that are doing good things and good dogs too. Yeah, that the joyfulness uh, being around those dogs um, in the school in Italy uh, really comes through in the book. Well, you, you think about a little dog and how much joy it gives you. And then when you're with a dog the size of a bear and it, the dog is enthusiastic, I mean, that enthusiasm is multiplied and, and you do feel that joy and that desire to be with you, play with you, do whatever you want. It's, it's really fun. It's really just fun, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, as uh, was, um, we got in the introduction, uh, from the moment you met Al, you knew she was a special dog, uh, but also a problem child, uh, easily distracted, not altogether obedient. Uh, like her owner, Donatella, you must have had some doubt that she was ready to become a rescue dog. Um, certainly Ferruccio, the president of the school did. Yes, she was not doing what she was asked to do. And Donatella was trying to everything. She was trying to be patient. She was trying to urge her to do something else. She was ask, actually one of the things that was so interesting at the school was that there were was this community of people that were training their dogs. And they would share dogs where if you had a dog and I had a dog, I would give you my dog to work with and you give me your dog. And part of that was so the dog may learn something different from somebody or because when they were going to go rescue somebody, they didn't want the dog to only go for one person. They wanted to be able to train the dog to go for anyone that needed help. And early on, a while ago, actually, somebody asked me, why do you need to have dogs patrolling the beach? I mean, you may already have a lifeguard that's professional there in the stand or patrolling, walking the, walking along the sand, why do you need to have somebody with a dog? Well, the thing about the Newfoundlands is that they can pull six people in at one time and a Labrador can pull in two people at a time and, and the Golden Retriever and the German Shepherds can also pull in two people. So you have that strength and that ability to rescue more people at the same time. But by having the dog and the other human there, you've got more eyes on the water. And a lot of what the people in Italy do with the rescue school is that they patrol the beaches voluntarily and they watch for something to happen before it happens. So they prevent a drowning. You know, last, I think it was July or August, there was a story on CNN about 14 children that had been pulled out on rubber inflatable rafts way offshore. And there were two owners with their Labradors who saw somebody waving in the distance and they went out and rescued all 14. Wow. So they're, they're trained to really help. And the Coast Guards have used the dogs to do the rescuing, but there are times where they have to pull people over because they've been speeding on the water or they're doing operating in a place where they're not supposed to be. And the face of the dog or the, the face of the Newfoundland helps to calm them down. And it, it is, a, is a good distraction. And so the person leaves with a ticket and maybe not so upset as if the dog hadn't been there. You, you have another story in the book about uh, a rescue, a dog rescuing over a hundred people. I think it was off the coast of Canada. And uh, the dog's name, had a, he had a, a wonderful name, Harry Man. And uh, this dog, uh, like you're describing, was able to um, carry a piece of wood and a rope to uh, the uh, survivors of, of a shipwreck and to pull uh, all of these people to safety. Yes, it was. it's this lore off the coast, it's this lore about can all over Canada about this dog named Harry Man. The, the entire family and the dog went out to rescue people and because of this dog, there were more than 100 survivors, but Harry Man just instinctively knew what to do in these 
incredibly rough seas. And because of his double coat, the undercoat and the overcoat that he has, he was not chilled by the incredibly cold waters. And he had been used primarily as a dog to pull in fishing lines. And that's what Newfoundlands are trained to do. In fact, a lot of people go, oh, I don't want a dog that has big slobbery lips because they drool all the time. Well, the reason they have big slobbery lips is because they needed to be able to breathe when they are pulling in the fishing lines. And if their lips were really tight, they wouldn't have been able to breathe. So they've been bred to be able to have loose lips. So you'll see people nowadays with little bibs on their dogs <laughs> so that if the dog rules, the person is able to wipe the dog's face. But um, they also have Newfoundlands now that are dry lips, that their lips are tighter. But it was really amazing to read about the Newfoundland historically. And I wrote a little bit about the book and how they were in one dog in particular, Seaman was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition and protected the men on their way west. And there were there were instances where there were there was a bear that attacked. There were Indians that were North American Indians that were um, attacking. And so the dog was there and protected them as well. The thing that's so interesting to me, though, about the Newfoundland is the dog is a big, gentle breed. On the other hand, it can be a dog that's extremely protective. You know, you describe them as uh, built for swimming. Uh, the their chest is like kind of the uh, the bow on a, a boat. It kind of creates a kind of hull effect. But uh, I think that uh, you can you you speak as an authority because I think of you as built for swimming as well. Well, I am able to float in the water and move through it pretty easily. I think that part of it is being able to relax when I'm breathing and let my lungs fill up with air like balloons. And so I'm very, very relaxed when I swim. And when the Newfoundlands and also the Golden Retrievers and Labradors, uh, somewhat German Shepherds, but when they're swimming, they're relaxed in the water. With the Newfoundland, their paws are enormous. They're webbed so that they're able to swim like they have paddles on. They're really able to grab the water and pull it and move forward. And I think that they have a huge advantage over all the other dogs. One of the things that I did because I was, because I was able to get in the water with a dog named Mass and she was this huge black Newfoundland, I was able to hold on to the top of her harness and have her pull me to shore. And at first I was a little, weirded out by it because I thought, you know, it's not fair for this dog to have to pull me in. She's going to have to work so hard. So I held on to the top of her harness and it was just like a Sunday stroll. She had no problem and she just raced ashore. So we went back out in the water and I swam down underneath her and watched her paddle, her watched her paws move. And she swam sort of a specialized breaststroke where she was able to really grab the water all the way around and she had a very very strong kick so pulling me in was really easy for her and actually when we get to shore she wanted to do it again oh nice you know you talk about that dog mass and uh that was uh, ferruccio's dog yes the, the head yes. of the school and uh how uh the dog would actually teach the other dogs including al Right. So Ferrucci Palenga was the one that had the idea to create the school, I think now about 25 years ago. And he had had an incident where his daughter and friend were in the water. And I guess one of them was having a hard time. And his dog was Newfoundland, ran into the water and pulled them up. So that gave him an idea to, to have this school. And when I went to Italy and met with him, he was really happy to have me meet Mass and to see how she worked with people. But toward the end of a few sessions, he would have the other dogs come in and Mass would show Al and the other water dogs how to swim around a person, how to pull them to shore. And I thought that was really fascinating that one dog will teach another, just like you know, one triathlete works with another and helps somebody develop their running or their swimming or their or cycling. The same thing was happening with the dogs. I, I thought it was interesting when you describe Ferruccio, the head of the school, uh, it, it, he, he actually takes almost like a military um, uh, 
process procedure uh, with the dogs. And I th is it because he works so closely with the Coast Guard? Yes, he is really all about safety and all about performance. And so he is, I mean, I felt really weird putting on a life jacket when I was going swimming. I mean, I swim, I've done this all my life, I've crossed channels and it didn't make sense to me to have to put on a life jacket, but he was all about safety and this is what they were doing. And this is the way you train with a dog. So I put on the life jacket. I mean, I was a guest there and I do what, whatever I was told because I felt like I was getting to do something that most people don't get to do. And he is extremely thorough and the dogs have to do certain things before they are allowed to go out on the Coast Guard boats. They have to pass certain tests. And then if they reach a certain level, then they're allowed to go on the Coast Guard boat. But then they also have to pass certain tests when they're on the boat to be able to perform the life-saving roles that they've been trained to perform. You, you know, um, you, you're out on the water uh, where, where you've spent uh, so much of your life. And you talk about uh, Ferruccio, the head of the, the school, being so attuned to the conditions, reading the conditions on the water. And I know that's something that you uh, could appreciate because of uh, your having learned to read the conditions of the water uh, from uh, riptides to uh, currents, whirlpools, huge waves in Antarctica, and even uh, calving glaciers. Uh, I remember uh, the stories uh, when you were swimming the, um, the, uh, uh, the English Channel about uh, how much Reg Brickell, the, uh, the man who uh, guided you on that, uh, those swims taught you. Yeah, actually when you swim the English Channel, it's changed a lot. But when I did it the first time, the way you swam was by beside the boat and the pilot used radar. And so the first time I swam the English Channel, I swam 30 miles because you swim this inverted S. The second time I swam it, the currents were stronger, so I swam 33 miles and swam that inverted us again. Reg Brickle really knew how to position me to be able to cut through the currents. And on each of those swims, when I swam from England to France, I was, I, I was my goal was to set the world record. So he knew how important it was to maintain a really direct course, but that's as direct as we could get way back then. Nowadays, when people swim across the English Channel, you use GPS. So if you look at a swim, a map that a channel swimmer uses along with a pilot on an English channel swim, they swim 21, 22, maybe 23 miles. So it, the sport has changed a lot, but there's also that sense of being a great pilot, of knowing when the water's going to be safe, when the, water, when the waves are going to be down, when the weather's going to be good. And if you can get the weather and tides to coordinate, then you're able to set off on a good swim. And there are pilots that have that knowledge because they were fishermen as children and learned it from their father and from their grandfather. And so that same kind of thing I saw with Ferruccio, that he had this real strong connection to the water, that we were standing by this lake and I was looking at it. Lake Lago Isiocardo, and I was looking at the water and I could see that in the distance, the water color had changed. And I was like, okay, yeah, the wind is coming from that direction. It's starting to ruffle the water. And so he looked at me and said, you know, the wind's coming from over there. <laughs> so let's go over here for the swim. And, and so I think, again, it's, it's when you're around water people, I mean, you were an avid surfer and you know, you pretty much can read when the waves are going to be good and you know when to go surfing. And so much of my ability to read the water has come from being around surfers and about around fishermen, around people that really know about the water. So I think that that's helped me with my swims, but also have this great appreciation for Donatella and for the other people at the school. You know, I have to put a plug, you know, you mentioned my surfing, I have to put a plug in for surfers they are the ones who taught you how to get out through the shore bake without being uh, pummeled and crushed. Yes, you know, when I was when I started out doing open water swimming, I was 14 years old. And so that was a really long time ago. And I didn't know a lot. And so I often go to people that are the experts and they were surfers around Seal Beach and Huntington Beach and Laguna Beach. 
that I would just talk to and say, okay, how can I get out here without getting smashed? Or, okay, when should I go ashore? So I can either ride the wave in, but I don't get plummeled by it. Um, they're, the surfers were really, really good to me, but I think that um, they were also helped me with races because they pointed out where the rips are and how you could use a rip to catch it, to then ride it out and get, get out ahead of the other swimmers. Surfers are great. You know, you've also, I know, because my introduction to you was uh, uh, a podcast you had done uh, talking about your experience with uh, Grace and the, uh, the baby gray whale. But uh, uh, you've also had your run in with, uh, with sharks. I remember the uh, Cape of Good Hope that uh, you had a, a kind of a close call. Can you talk about that? Yes, I was trying to be the first person to swim around the Cape of Good Hope from the Atlantic Ocean around into the Indian Ocean. And local people wanted me to use a shark cage, but I decided that, that didn't make any sense because there are waves that are generated in the Antarctic that you can suddenly right that can suddenly rise up around you, 25, 30 foot waves. And if you're in a shark cage, it will take the cage down with you and the boat that it's attached to. So the idea of using a shark cage didn't make any sense, but there was a group of men that were special forces that worked with the Cape, Cape Town Police Department who love to spearfish and dive at around Cape Point. And they offered to come with me on my swim. They um, worked it out so that they had a group of, of a team of men watching the water along with the pilot. And then they would have one person in the water with me. And when we were about 400 meters from finishing the swim, which had been a really dramatic swim because we had to go out through 20 foot waves and, and had to time it so that we wouldn't get crunched by them or make it out through the break that was so foamy from, from the crashing of the water that when we got around the point, we sort of relaxed a little bit and then got to within 400 meters from shore and a 12 foot bronze whale or shark came up for me out of the water. And fortunately, Doug was there beside me watching the water and he had a spear gun and he shot the shark in the dorsal fin. The shark turned and pulled the spear out of its side and swam off. And then the crew was really concerned because at that point of time, the area was really full of sharks and they were concerned that the blood in the water would attract other sharks. So they were encouraging me to swim really fast and I didn't need any encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> I was going as fast as I could. And afterwards, when I went to shore and Doug came in and he was stretching out the, the shark gun, I asked him, you know, what happened to the shark? And he said, well, I hit him in the dorsal fin and I said, is it gonna be okay? And he said, yes, he will be. I'm like, okay. But um, the waters there have changed there and there are more and more open water swimmers that are swimming around South Africa than ever before. And they've told me that part of it is because there are orcas offshore now that are patrolling and pretty much keeping the sharks away. And one of the one of the coolest things I've seen through the course of my life now as an open water swimmer, not just as an author, but that there are so many people that are getting into the sport of open water swimming and they're really aware of what the ocean quality is and they're having an effect on it. Like the Surf Riders Association, they're trying to put pressure on governments to in, in, encourage water quality in certain areas. They, they help each other out. When you want to swim around the Cape of Good Hope, I would be able to put in, you in touch with somebody that you want to get in touch with to find a good pilot. There's this whole network around the world now that, that exists. And you were at the Vanguard. Yeah, it was. The, there were people in the 50s that were doing open water swimming, and there were a few in the 60s, but a lot of the swims that I started doing, nobody in the world had ever done before, like the Cape of Good Hope, the Straits of Magellan, the Beagle Channel. And so, it, and, and for more recently, the swim off Greenland that I did in 26 degree water. So these things were just really far out there. And now I think that people are realizing that they don't just have to swim Catalina or the English Channel or Lake Powell that, I mean, and those are all great swims to do and they're all really exciting, but people are realizing that they can find other places to swim and enjoy it. And, you know, just because 
you're a long distance swimmer and you think you should swim the English Channel, maybe if you're not really good at the cold, why not think about swimming in the Red Sea instead? Why not, why not swim to your strength and do what you enjoy? And I think that people are beginning to realize that you don't have to follow everyone else. You can make your own way. I see. Um, but back to dogs. <laughs> uh, so you're, you, you know, you, uh, alluded to this earlier, your experience with Newfoundlands came uh, actually much earlier with two dogs that your Italian friends made fun of named Pork and Beans. Uh, and you actually, uh, we'll go back to surfing, you actually body surfed with those dogs in uh, Emerald Bay, uh, California. Yes, uh, my friend Brian had Pork and Beans and Otis. And Otis was this big, huge black Newfoundland. And the other two were the Lanciers, the black and white Newfoundlands. And so I decided to take them to Laguna Beach one day to Emerald Bay. And so I just thought I'll go for a swim with them. Brian told me they like to swim. So I got in the water and one dog was on each side of me and one behind me as if they were my mascots. And it was just fun to swim with them. And they had the sense of not to climb on me or just scratch me. They just swam with me. So we swam probably a mile or two or three together. I can't even remember. But then the waves started breaking and the dogs looked at me and I was like, okay. It turned out that they knew how to body surf. I mean, this is, again, before you had people riding waves with, with dogs on their surfboards. These Newfoundlands were looking for the waves, waiting for a certain time, and then paddling as fast as they could to ride the wave to shore. And so we were body surfing, and it was so much fun. And they were like little kids. There was a certain point where I was tired, and they just wanted to keep going. And I'm like, okay, we'll do this. We'll do this again some other day. But that was one of the most unbelievable times I've ever had. Of I'd never thought you could body surf with Newfoundlands. You know. Um. You say that uh, Ferruccio remembers every rescue and that uh, the dogs, uh, his rescue dogs save hundreds of people a year stationed on 48 beaches and lakes in Italy. Um, you're saying, you, you've told me though, that there's, uh, we, we don't think of this as something we uh, have in the US, but in fact, there are uh, similar organizations. There are people here in the United States that are doing water rescue training with their Newfoundlands. And I'm just finding out about it because I didn't even know I've been in touch with the Newfoundland Club of America and found out that they have different water tests and different training methods. And also in Canada, they have a group of people there that are training their dogs to do water rescues. And it's a fun way for the owner and the, the dog to stay in shape, but to do something that's really community oriented and to have fun together. The thing though is that from what I've heard so far, and I don't know much about the way the dogs are trained in the United States or in Canada, but I've heard that they train differently and the methods are different, but the idea is still using the dog's natural tendency to love to swim, to be a rescue dog, and to then work with those skills and train them to be able to rescue people. Nice. Um, back to Al. Uh, you the, the attachment you describe between Al and Donatella is uh, so emotional for Donatella. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, her uh, connection to this dog, as I said, is uh, almost supernatural. Can you talk about that a little bit? The thing is with Al that she would anticipate whatever Donatella was going to ask of her. She was constantly watching her. She was aware of her and she was always trying to please her. But often her exuberance would get in the way of pleasing Donatella, that she would lose her head, that you know Donatella would wanna just walk her along the beach and Donatella would see the other dogs in the water and Al would see the other dogs in the water and would just wanna jump in and swim with them. So, the dog was so strong that she often towed Donatella. And there was one time where I just thought I was going to pull up Donatella into the water. And the funny thing is that once 
she got to the edge of the water, she stopped and looked at Donatella, realizing that this isn't what she was supposed to be doing. So I think that Donatella and her relationship developed even stronger over the last, I think, about 10 years now. And Al has gone on to do additional training in addition to the water dog training. She's been trained to do um, search and rescue, which is not common, Donatella for, told me, for the Newfoundland dog. She said that most Newfoundlands don't have a great sense of smell, but she knows Al and said Al does. And she said she wished early on that she had taught Al to become a truffle dog because those dogs like earn so much by getting the truffles and the the once back to food again, the truffles are so delicious that Donatella would have, have enjoyed Al going out and finding them. But um, they really became a team and have done some extraordinary things since I met them. You know, you you talk about uh, uh, there are times when you're actually swimming in the lake and you're swimming backstroke and the dogs are um, uh, used to seeing people uh, waving their arms, wanting to be rescued. And the dog mistakes your backstroke for wanting to be rescued. Uh, and it also mistakes uh, ducks flying and even dragonflies uh, wanting to rescue all these creatures. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting uh, note that uh, this dog was so attuned to what was going on in the water that it wanted to rescue everything. She was, and that's what the thing was, was that she just didn't, she saw more than a lot of the other dogs saw and she responded to more than a lot of the other dogs saw. And so that was one of the things that Donatella eventually realizes that the, she has a very special dog. And, yeah. and she knew it sort of, from her heart, she knew it, but from the way Al performed, she hadn't really seen it happen. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil the uh, the wonderful ending of your book, but uh, when it comes time for Al's test, uh, Donatella, his uh, his owner, isn't necessarily prepared for success, and that the two years that Al has been in training may be all for naught. Can you take us back to that day and to Donatella? Well, Donatella was trying not to be nervous because she knew that that would make Al nervous, I think. So we wound up going to Genoa together and going out on the Coast Guard boat. And we traveled along shore and the Coast Guard picked out a certain area where Al was going to do her test. And I don't know what Donatella was thinking, but I don't. I think she was not sure that Al would be able to do the test. And I think that she was really worried that um, they would have to go back and continue training. And it was, it was hard because they had spent so much time getting to that moment. Um, you, you, you remind us of Al's poetry, uh, that uh, the bloodline connects her to other legendary dogs, including, as you mentioned, uh, the Meriwether Lewis uh, dog and uh, to also Lord Byron's boat swing. Um, so there was greatness in her from the beginning that uh, the, in, in her blood. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yes, the, I think that what I, what I wrote about was this history of the Newfoundland and how extraordinary the breed is and how Byron wrote poetry about him, about Bob Swan and how the Newfoundlands helped open up the West Coast of the United States. And so there was, there was greatness in her, in her blood because she came from a, a line of dogs that had been dogs that had been ship dogs for the explorers that had been on board ships that were fishing ships from Spain and from England. And so this breed was a very hardy and loved dog because the dog spent all the time on board the ships with, with the fishermen, but also um, were known for rescuing the fishermen if they fell overboard. So there was a sense that, you know, there's promise with an owl because she's this genetic link to this whole amazing history of Newfoundlands. Right. Um, I, I have to mention uh, as a little digression here that uh, it is 35 years ago, um, 
this year that you uh, swam the Bering Strait, you did your, uh, your, your swim between uh, Little Diomede and Big Diomede Island. And uh, uh, I know last year you went back uh, kind of a, for a reunion tour with uh, two, uh, you flew into Anchorage, probably the only person uh, bringing a swimsuit with them to Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and you went back to Nome and you uh, saw some of the people that had helped you uh, on that journey. Uh, you wanna talk about that a little bit? Well, actually I, it, was, it was August 6th and 7th of, of 1987 that I did that swim, but I did do that going back to meet one person in particular, a man named Larry Main, who had been a track coach somewhere in Oregon and left there and wound up being in, in Nome when I was training offshore alone. And so he saw me working out and started offering to walk the beach with me. He had been there mining gold because that had been one of his childhood dreams to just go there and pan gold and live in a tent. So I thought this is really nice, but maybe it's a little strange to have a person that I don't even know offer to do this for me. But it turned out that every day he did that. And so now, 35 years later, I went to St. Petersburg to meet Larry again and to catch up on all those years and to find out what he had been doing. And that connection that we had, you know, it was so funny because it was so immediate and so intense because I was preparing to swim across the Bering Strait and that was the focus. And so many years had passed, but those memories were so vivid for both of us. And he had had an incredible life since then. And so to be able to sit down and share that, now he's, I think, 86 years old and he's known throughout the community. And it was just so great to see this old friend, you know? You said that there were days when you would train, he would walk the beach while you trained. And you said that there were days when you'd get down to the beach and he, he lived in a tent on the beach that uh, you, was, you were hoping, hoping he uh, wouldn't open the zipper of the tent, that's uh, how uh, forbidding the, uh, the water was, uh, was there. Actually, that was a huge memory because it was cold. It was about 45 or 50 degrees air temperature and the water temperature was warmer than I thought it would be. It was about 48 to 50 as well. And there were days where it would be so windy that there'd be huge white caps and one day I went in and swam with him walking the beach with me, but actually he wound up walking backwards <laughs> because the current was so strong. I was swimming as hard as I could go and I was going backwards. And I came out of the water just like, oh my gosh, that was so horrible. And he said, yeah, but you were there. Yeah, you did it. Wow, what an impressive thing. And I'm like, I guess that was good. I guess, you know, just sometimes just getting in and doing it gets you to the next day, you know? And, and he was that kind of person where he had been a track coach, he had run himself and he knew that some days are easier to get out there and work out than others. And, but you need to keep doing it. And once you back off, that can affect the outcome of what you want. So I, I remember great. the day we were talking about this, we were uh, swimming in uh, Los Alamitos Bay uh, and the water temperature was, you know, somewhere in the upper 60s, maybe even 70 degrees in the, you know, in, in the warmth. And uh, it, it struck me, though, when I stepped into the ocean with you uh, that day that uh, I was stepping into the ocean with someone who uh, had not just swum all these uh, amazing uh, crossings, passages, uh, lakes, uh, seas, but uh, that you would, you were a, you're really a survivor. You've survived so much, uh, you know, uh, danger and near misses. And uh, it, it's really striking to, uh, to swim with you because uh, of that, uh, you know, that breadth of experience. Well, that was, it was really fun to swim with you. But it, it, the thing is, you know, that I'm really, really super careful that before I did the swim in Fan Antarctica, for instance, I spent two years preparing for it and having three Zodiac boats with three doctors on board and people that could pull me out of the water and all sorts of backups in case something went wrong. And I always had people along with me that were really smart so that if the plan A didn't work or plan B or plan C, that 
whoever was on the boat could figure out what else we could do. I mean, when I was planning to do a swim in Antarctica, you know, I was all set to, to start the swim and head to a certain point. And they said, no, no, you can't go there because the glaciers cap and hit the water so hard that anyone in the boat is going to be thrown into the water or the, the calving glacier can fall on them and kill them. And so what that all did for me was to realize that often you just need to step back and listen to the locals like we did before we went swimming. We checked out the water quality. Uh, we found out that there was nothing in the water that was not safe to swim with. And we did the things like the, sh the stingray shuffle so that we didn't get stung when we went in the water. And then we started swimming across along the shore. And that's the other thing I think that a lot of people think you just jump in and somewhere and swim across, but it's not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember that day that we swam uh, was the day before Jeff Bezos was going to uh, uh, become a, a space tourist and uh, go up and uh, 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 on his rocket. And uh, I, I asked you if you'd be, you know, he's talking about colonizing Mars by the end of the decade. I asked you if you'd be interested in uh, uh, being one of the people to colonize Mars with Jeff Bezos. And you had a very funny thing you said to me. You said, uh, uh, no, you wouldn't because you'd miss the ocean too much. It's true. We are water people. I can appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I have to, in closing, I, uh, I know the answer to this, but uh, I want to ask you for, for everyone uh, to tell us about uh, when you did go to Alaska to Anchorage, uh, did you actually get in the water and swim uh, the last time you were there? Actually, I didn't have any time to go swimming, and it was early in May, so that the water temperature was really cold. But we did take a um, ferry from Petersburg to Bellingham, Washington, which was fantastic because it was a time when the ferries weren't crowded and the seas weren't heavy and there were humpback whales and dolphins and lots of sea life. So it was a great water. It was a great whale watching time as well. Oh, nice. Um, okay, uh, do you want to turn it over to the question and answer period? Sure, that'd be great. All right, let me see what we've got here. Uh, we've got a question from Jessica. Um, was the video of the water rescue dogs part of a documentary on dogs? The video wasn't part of a documentary. It was just a short clip, maybe five minutes long. And there are probably six or seven now more recent clips about the water rescue dogs in Italy. Um, I'm waiting for other questions here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, what else can you tell us, Lynn? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I, you know, I think uh, that I, I think that what's really important to talk about about the new book. Actually, I was going to show it. Um, this is the new Tales book, of Al. Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog. And you can see Al's uh, brown Newfoundland lying on a stand-up paddleboard in Lake, Lago, Lago Isiocardo, and Idros Carlo, I'll get it eventually. And she is just at that point, I think she's about 12 years old. So the thing about the book is that it's really about the stories about love and courage and about overcoming obstacles and about believing in somebody that may not be at the level you hope them to be and watching somebody flourish. Um, the whole point of writing the book though was to bring something really positive into the world. And that's the way I write my stories. There, I've written seven books now. This is number seven and I have a new children's book that will come out next year. But I really focus on stories that are positive because I think that it's inspiring to read things that are happy, that you see somebody triumphing, triumphing. Um, and <laughs> let me try that one again. <laughs> Succeeding at. And I think that I really want to bring good things into the world. 
Um, my first book was Swimming to Antarctica, and it was about all of those different swims around the Cape of Good Hope, across the Straits of Magellan, you know, across the Strait of Gibraltar, very challenging things and doing things for the first time and then opening borders. And the next book was about Grayson, about the baby whale that got lost. And I went on to write a children's book and a manual and a book about Raul Amundsen, who was the first man to reach the South Pole. And the reason I wrote about him was because he succeeded. Shackleton and Scott didn't succeed and their stories were extremely dramatic, but I really wanted to focus on the man who made it and why he did it. And his story wasn't as compelling because people didn't die around him. He didn't have tremendous failure. He planned it out, he worked out, he trained, he spent years preparing and he succeeded. And I really admire that than the tragedy of, of somebody's um, attempt. So I wrote about uh, Amundsen and then went on to work on this book. You, you also wrote a book that is about another test that you, uh, that you had in your life uh, called Swimming in the Sink. Uh, you had... Uh, uh, a very emotional experience that uh, uh, took you out of swimming for a time. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I wrote Swimming in the Sink, and it was sort of the contrast between swimming to Antarctica, because here you are swimming to this continent, and, and it's ice, and it's challenging, it's very difficult. And then I had, in my life, some really, for me, tragedies. My, my dog, Cody, passed away. My mom died. My dad died. Um, I had to leave the neighborhood where I'd spent a lot of my life, and so much of it affected my heart. So I had what was called broken heart syndrome, and I almost died. Uh, and it took friends and and family encouraging me to get well and be positive and meditate. And at one point, I couldn't swim in the ocean anymore, but what I could do is put on my cap and goggles and put my hand in the sink and move them and swim in the sink. So that's how I got the title for that book. And since then, I've recovered my health and fallen in love and <laughs> gotten married and life has gone on. And so I think, you know, writing that was a really tough thing to do because I was really revealing my heart in many different ways. But I felt it was really important to talk to people about how much loss happens and, and what it does to you and physically and emotionally and what things people can do to draw upon support from others to get back in and, and not, not grieve the loss all the time. And part of that for me was being able to eventually get back into swimming and swim with dogs and be with friends and go on to the next chapter of my life. You know, uh, I, I'm going to backpedal a little bit here. Um, another uh, uh, connection that you and I have uh, was, uh, is, is, I should say, Grayson, uh, the baby whale that you helped to save. And uh, when I heard that story, I was so moved by it uh, that I was lucky enough to meet you and to uh, write a script uh, because we'd like to uh, tell that story for the big screen. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, rescue of that baby whale for people who don't know? Well, the story started because I was training very early in the morning off the coast of Southern California, a place called Seal Beach. And I had just expected to do a very short workout and be done for the day. But there was a fisherman named Steve on the Seal Beach Pier who was waving to me and explained to me that I had a baby gray whale follow me that had lost his mother and that I had to stay out there and help him find his mom. So, <laughs> so I, at first I wasn't sure what to do and I wasn't sure if I could get near this, this whale or if it would hurt me because I'd never been next to an animal that was about 17 feet long. But what happened was the, the whale started moving closer to me and staying near me. And as the hours passed, I named him Grayson. And we swam way offshore because I think he might have heard his mother calling or maybe another whale, but we swam about a mile offshore and suddenly he disappeared. And I thought maybe he's gone and I wound up waiting a while for him and then he reappeared. 
And there was a group of people that were fishermen, that were lifeguards, that were people on the pier that started watching for Grayson's mom. That was the time of the year, it was March. And at that time of year, gray whales are migrating from Mexico back north, past California, up along the Northwest Pacific coast to Alaska. And so there were whales at that time that were migrating, but none of them were, was his mother. So um, the story continues on. And I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to tell, yeah. but, but you wrote a very beautiful script about the encounter and the whales and what was happening. And I, I, I think at the, some point, you know, I, it I reaches the big screen. I, I, I think yeah. the world should know that story. I think it would be a great, uh, you know, family uh, movie. I um, think it would too. And, and actually, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but This American Life did an interview with me and they really focused in on that story and did an, an amazing job. Yeah, so, I love that. I, yeah. Yeah. Then that's, that's exactly what happened is you initially heard part of that story. But since then, they, the, This American Life came back with Phoebe Judge and they asked for more details to then make it a profile for their NPR series. Right. And, and they, did, they, they did an incredible job. I remember the, the way they ended the story was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, you had rescued this whale but you had done a Catalina swim where uh, you had actually gotten lost. You and your uh, pilot had gotten lost in the fog and uh, you were actually rescued. So uh, it, it was a kind of ironic twist at the end that uh, uh, it, it was you rescuing the whale and then you being rescued as well. Yeah. It, it it was a really important connection that they made and I hadn't even thought about it, but you know, that sense of being lost. I mean, we, I think people go through that in their lives. And there was that time when I was in the middle of Catalina Channel and the fall came in and I lost the connection with a support boat and with the dory and with, well, the coach on the paddleboard was nearby me, but we were, it was midnight, it was pitch black in the fog. And so to be so scared that we might never find our crew again and to have somebody that was an, not experienced in the water telling me, just keep swimming. And fortunately I realized that that was not the right thing to do. And actually, if you look back at what happened with Grayson, we stayed in a, a certain area. We didn't go very far with the hope that the mother whale would return. Uh, the I can't tell you how frightening that is to me, uh, the st story of being lost in the Catalina Channel in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, uh, in the fog, uh, losing not just your support boat, but the, as you say, the, uh, the man in the dory, the pilot in the dory. Uh, you know, that's a, that is a terrifying story. You know, it's really interesting because after that swim, I decided I never wanted to swim again, I was done. I mean, that's how scared I was, but I also had overtrained for that swim. And, and I think I was really just tired of swimming, but I was very fortunate that I had a friend, Fami Atala, who had attempted the English Channel four times and he never made it. He got within 400 meters ashore. He'd been swimming 24 hours with his head above water, breaststroke, because that's the way he swam in Egypt. and the crew thought he'd gone into hypothermia and pulled him out of the water. And so, you know, after four times of trying and then not making it, he never went back again, but it always affected him. And so he was somebody I'd reached out to when I wanted to swim the English Channel the first time. And so when he found out that I had attempted the Catalina Channel the second time and I hadn't made it, he really encouraged me to go back and do it. And my folks did as well, and so did the coach. In fact, my folks are saying, you know, just do it. You can hang up your swimsuit afterwards. You need to follow through and finish it. Otherwise, it'll bother you all your life. And so two weeks later, I went back and I swam and I broke the world record for men and women and realized that I still had other things I wanted to do and that they were right. And I was really lucky that they did more than just encourage. They really pushed me. And I think at that point in my life, it was really important because I was 17 years old. And I think that when you work so hard and train so hard and you really are prepared and you had something that didn't go right, 
that you need to step back and go in better conditions and try again. And, you know, I never would have had so many of my life's experiences had I stopped at age 17. Right. And I am really, really fortunate that, you know, not fortunate that Fami didn't make it across the English Channel, but fortunate that I gained that wisdom from him, you know. Right. Uh, did you say that you actually went back two weeks later and uh, made that swim? Two wow. weeks later. And I also, what I did is I rested a lot because the coach that I'd worked with had been working with Olympic athletes, the different coach that I'd worked with initially. And he believed that more is better. So I was training six hours a day in the ocean and I was just so tired. I didn't sleep and I couldn't, I didn't care about eating. I had overtrained. And so by the time I was ready to do the swim, I mentally wasn't in great shape and physically I was exhausted. So then I got lost in the fog. And that was the, the final thing that just made me go, okay, I'm done with this. Wow. So my folks said, you know, you need to back off on the workouts. You need just to rest, taper, and, and we'll tell you. So you don't worry about it. We'll tell you the day that you're set to go. Because I had trained so long and so hard, I, I had tapered and I was ready. And so I decided to swim from the mainland to the island because my brother held the record for swimming Catalina from the island to the mainland. And I didn't want to break his record. I wanted to do a different swim than him. So I broke, I can't even remember, I think the woman's record about an hour faster um, and the men's record 20 minutes or something like that faster. And then I decided that, you know, I could spend my life swimming Catalina or the English Channel, but there are things out there that nobody's ever done. And wouldn't it be amazing to do the research and make the connections with people and figure out how to do these things that are so unimaginable. You know, like how do you swim across the Strait of Magellan? You know, ships sink, sink if they try to go across there. The currents are crazy and, and the storms and they're huge whirlpools. You know, why wouldn't it be amazing if a human being could do it? So that became the goal. You know, I think about your <laughs> your uh, your Cook Strait swim as well. Uh, how harrowing that was, and how uh, hard you fought, and uh, you uh, that it, there was a point in which you actually could have, and maybe even should have gotten out, but you didn't. Uh, that was that was one of the toughest swims I've ever done. I mean, the swim from the North Island to the South Island is only 10 miles in a straight right, line New Zealand, in New Zealand. Right, right. Yeah, and I just, I figured, okay, I can make that swim in five hours. It takes me four hours to do 10 miles. And if there's some currents or whatever, I will just, it'll take another hour. But on that swim, the current was so strong and there was, there was a storm moving in from the South, from Antarctica and from the North, from the Cook Islands, and we didn't know it. And so the two storms were converging on Cook Strait as I was beginning the swim. So all the normal cur current patterns were different. And after five hours of swimming, I had been swimming south around the North Island, and I was further from finishing the swim than I, than I was when I started the swim five hours before. Wow. So, you know, I could have stopped then, but my crew encouraged me to continue on and I didn't want to give up. And I think part of that was because I had pushed through on the Catalina swim. I had had that bad experience and had been able to make it through. So I thought, okay, my crew is telling me that the weather's going to improve and you'll eventually get over there. Well, I didn't know that it would take another mm, uh, five hours uh, to be able to actually it took 12 hours and six minutes to reach the other shore. So it was another seven hours of slogging through the water to get to the other side. But um, it was amazing to make it. And the way the New Zealanders celebrated was to ring church bells all throughout the country the following day. Nice. And um, it was amazing, too, because at that point in time, the relationship between the U.S. and New Zealand was strained because they didn't want our Navy subs with nuclear um, missiles around there. And there were protests and things were not happy between the two countries. But because of the swim, there was this great change. And people were excited about, from New Zealand, were excited about having me there. And 
the prime minister of the country while I was doing the swim called out to wish me luck. So it was an incredible event. And then after it was finished, I went back to high school <laughs> and back to, you know, the everydayness of working out with the swim teams and playing water polo and studying because if I didn't get good grades, I wasn't, my parents wouldn't allow me to um, play sports. That was more important than anything else. The only girl and in the, the thing world. Yeah, the only girl in the world to actually go back to high school after swimming the uh, the Cook's Great. Yeah, well, that was it was good because I had good friends and that gave me stability to realize that these things are just part of life. They're not all of life. And um, there were still I still had so much learning to do. I'm going to go to the uh, question and answer. Uh, we have uh, somebody who wants to know. Uh, are there water rescue dog programs in the U.S.? Yes, there are. And I'm just beginning to find out about them. But I think that if you're really interested in finding out more, you can reach out to the Newfoundland, Newfoundland Club of America. And they're networked all throughout the U.S. and know who's teaching where and who's participating. Um. Another question uh, from Lizzie. Uh, she says, in your book, Swimming to Antarctica, uh, she found it amazing how you persevered to finally be allowed to swim in the USSR. How did you maintain your efforts on achieving that goal for so long with so many obstacles? I think that I really believed that we needed to figure out how to work some way with the Soviet Union, that I grew up in an age of the Cold War. And with the fear that either the Soviets would blow us up or they would, or we would blow them up. So I really felt that something has to be done to bridge that distance. And the idea initially came to me because my dad suggested it. I mean, he was a conservative physician, but he had been a corpsman in the Navy during World War II and he didn't carry a gun and he saw what war did. And so he was the one that encouraged me to swim from Little Diomede in the United States to Big Diomede in the Soviet Union. And when I looked closely, I could see that there was a border halfway between the two countries, but it wasn't just the border, it was the international date line. And so I started thinking about it, you know, if I can do the swim, it's about reaching from the present into the future. And physically, the crew that is with me and I will bridge that distance will reach the Soviet Union. And the other thing is that we're only 2.7 miles apart. The US and Soviet Union are 2.7 miles apart. It's not the distance between Washington DC and Moscow, we're neighbors. So wouldn't it be great if we could be neighbors that are friendly? Wouldn't it be great if we could spend money on other things than military buildup? Wouldn't it be great if we could diminish the tensions between the two countries? So that, mantra kept me going that idea that something has to be done to to better our conditions yeah and uh if uh, uh people may not know that uh gorbachev actually premier gorbachev actually mentioned you in the uh summit uh where the nuclear arms treaty was signed about how you had brought the two countries uh, closer together Yes, that was a big surprise. Three months after I did the swim, President Gorbachev and President Reagan were at the White House and they were signing the INF Treaty. And President Gorbachev stood up and toasted the swim and said it showed how close each other the two countries are and how the relations between the United States and Soviet Union are changing. And I had no idea that he was going to do this. And it was incredible to realize that the effort that we had made had been noted and that it had made a change. And there were things that happened afterwards that did bring the US and Soviet Union closer together where air flights from Alaska to Siberia suddenly opened, where fishing rights changed, where both fleets could go in different waters. There was an international park that was created. Inuit who lived on the mainland of Alaska and on Little Diomede Island could see their relatives in Siberia. And there were other things that were that changed as a result of the swim. Um, 
this has been an amazing talk and uh you know it's always uh you're my friend but it's always an honor to talk to you and to uh you know not just uh spend time swimming with you but to uh follow you uh your now uh work as an author and uh, i just want to applaud you and uh, say that uh it this has been a really nice opportunity thank you so much chris and thanks very much for being the the interviewer and, and for asking the great questions and just everything. I mean, it's made it really special. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah, thank you so much for both of you um, being here tonight. It was truly a joy to listen to that conversation. Um, and thank you everyone who was able to join, um, join this event as well online. Um, I want to mention the to, for everyone to consider purchasing a copy of Tales of Owl. Um, I have the, the link uh, located in the chat here um, where you can purchase it from pals.com. Um, I've also added a link to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've recorded this event tonight, so it will be available on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days if you want to uh, rewatch it or would like to share it with someone who wasn't able to attend tonight. So we look forward to seeing you all um, another one of our events again soon. And until then, take care. And thank you so much for all of you being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.